Thank you. Tonight we are joined by nearly 200 members of the Institute's Board of Trustees from across the United States, as well as distinguished guests from across the policy community. This event is also being viewed live around the world. So as is the custom, I would be grateful if everyone, as Rob said, turned off the ringers on their phones, but you can feel free to tweet <laughs> as much as you like. The Soroff Symposium is the Institute's major annual event in Washington. It is named in memory of two outstanding patrons of the Institute, Sam and Helene Soroff, whose generosity was critical to survival of the Institute more than three decades ago. That generosity lives on in their wonderful extended family, many members of whom are with us today. Like all our donors, they are proud American citizens, committed to an active and engaged American role in pursuit of security and peace in the Middle East. To them and to all of our supporters, I say a heartfelt thank you. In these hyperpartisan times, I'm pleased to say that you have entered a partisan free zone. That's an oxymoron in DC, right? But the Washington Institute is an independent, nonpartisan research institution. We accept support only from American citizens. We do not accept any money from any foreign governments any foreign entities or any foreign persons. Not only do our trustees span the political spectrum, but our remarkable faculty of policy experts, women and men with vast experience as diplomats, scholars, journalists, and military leaders, span the spectrum of religions, ethnicity, and nationalities, both here and in the Middle East. Their mission is simple. To provide, our, to provide our government with information, analyses, and ideas to advance the pursuit of security and peace in the Middle East, and equally important, to do it on a timely basis. More than 30 years ago, both Republican and Democratic administrations, excuse me, for more than 30 years, both Republican and Democratic administrations have recognized the talent on our staff by tapping our scholars to serve in senior positions in both Republican and Democratic administrations. The tradition began with the author of our first policy paper. You may not believe this, but it's true over 35, almost 34 years ago, Dennis Ross, and it continues today. Last year, <laughs> you didn't know Dennis was that old, right? <laughs> Last year, Jim Jeffrey, our Philip Salon's distinguished fellow, was asked to serve as the Secretary of State's Special Envoy for Syria engagement. Jim was to be with us tonight, but he's on the job in Turkey. Just today, another member of our Institute family took a step closer to assuming a senior position when the Senate Foreign Relations Committee voted 19 to 3 to recommend to the full Senate the confirmation of our off-scene fellow David Schenker. <laughs> to, to serve as Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs. David, on behalf of the staff and trustees of the Washington Institute, please accept our warmest congratulations. We have a very full and exciting program this evening. To introduce our keynote event, I'm pleased to welcome my friend and partner, our Outstanding Institute President, Shelley Kassam. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for your decades of leadership and dedication to the Institute. I want to add my own welcome to the hundreds of trustees who are here this evening, especially members of our young leadership who have taken time from their professional and family lives to join us. Your presence underscores the depth of your commitment to the Institute. <clears throat> 
From our earliest days, the pursuit of peace has been central to our mission. Peace between Arabs and Israelis is not just a noble goal. It is a worthy American interest. It is not the only interest we have in the Middle East, nor always the most urgent, but it helps define what we as Americans stand for. And for more than 30 years, the scholars and experts of the Washington Institute have offered advice and ideas to administrations of both parties on how to achieve this important goal. Considerable, considerable progress has been made, including peace treaties between Israel and Arab states and incremental but important progress with the Palestinians. But peace remains elusive. Tonight, we will have the opportunity to take a close look at the next chapter of America's effort to promote peace. We will do that with the person who President Trump has entrusted to lead the American peace effort, his senior advisor, Jared Kushner. Thank you. A graduate of Harvard University with a joint law degree MBA from NYU, Mr. Kushner was a real estate developer before joining the 2016 election campaign that brought his father-in-law to the White House. A senior advisor to the president, he has a broad range of responsibilities from international trade and immigration to criminal justice reform. But tonight, we will focus, of course, on the Middle East, the pursuit of Arab-Israeli peace. And our format will be spontaneous and unscripted, a conversation between Jared Kushner and our executive director, Rob Satloff. As most of you know, Rob is the Washington Institute. He has been our director for the past 26 years. <laughs> Among his many talents, Rob is also a professional interviewer. For the past 14 years, he has hosted a weekly talk show on the U.S. government's Arabic satellite channel, explaining to Middle East viewers how Washington works, or doesn't work, as the case may be. Tonight, we get to see those interviewing skills in action. And if you don't appreciate all the nuances of their discussion, fear not, after dinner, our own peace process brain trust will be on stage to decipher precisely what we heard and what we didn't hear. And on behalf of the Washington Institute, I am pleased to welcome Mr. Jared Kushner. Good evening, everyone. This is a very special evening. I'm delighted all of you could join us for this discussion about the Trump administration's approach to Middle East peace. We're going to spend the next 45 minutes in a bit of a strange conversation, talking about something, but not really talking about it. <laughs> because tonight, unless we're going to make even more news than I expect, Tonight is not the big reveal. That day, if it happens, won't be for another month at the earliest. But there is still quite a lot to talk about the Middle East peace process without actually talking about the Middle East peace plan. So first, I just want to extend again my thanks to you, Jared, for joining us for this occasion. Thank you, Rob, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with all of you tonight. So, so let's begin with what you're proposing. Is it... <laughs> no, no. Sh I've listened carefully to the statements that you've made and your colleagues have made. Will it be a plan, a vision, a framework, a proposal? Which one of these words is an accurate description of what we're going to hear. So we could use a lot of different words to describe what it is that we've been working on, but uh, we're going away from all the typical uh, diplomatic speak about 
how do you describe things at the high level? What we've put together over the last year is, is I would say, uh, more of an in-depth operational uh, document that shows what we think is possible and how uh, the, the people can live together, how security could work, how uh, interaction can work, and, and really how do you try to form uh, the outline of what a brighter future could be. You know, I've, I've worked very closely now for the last two years on this with Jason Greenblatt, who's been uh, absolutely phenomenal. He's an amazing lawyer, and he's been a great partner in this, and with, obviously, David Friedman, who's been a great ambassador and also uh, was a great lawyer uh, in his time, and with Avi. And uh, what we've done is uh, we, we've been able to uh, we started by studying what had been tried and how people had approached us to date and why we thought in our estimation it hadn't been successful uh, at the time. So the first phase was really uh, an assessment phase. And we did that by studying the different efforts. We read a lot of books. We spoke to a lot of people. Um, we traveled around the region. We spoke to the negotiators who had been doing this for a long time. We spoke to uh, the uh, neighboring countries. And we really tried to pull from them uh, what they thought could be an appropriate uh, solution to this. And so as we got forward, we started saying, well, you know, a lot of the, the discussion and a lot of the disagreement seems to be about these high-level concepts. I always found in my business career that, you know, when you'd have a dispute on a contract, uh, you'd go into the details, and you could usually resolve things because that's what you do when you're motivated to move forward. And so we said, why don't we just start writing these out? Uh, this happened early on. We were saying, you know, two state versus one state. Uh, you're just, you know, you can't say two state. And I realized that means different things to different people. If you say two state, it means one thing to the Israelis. It means one thing to the Palestinians. So we said, you know, let's just not say it. Let's just, let's just say, let's, let's work on the details of what this means. And so we started writing down a document. And we said, um, started with five pages and made it to 10 pages, then to 20 pages, then to 30 pages. And we kept refining it as we would get more and more input uh, along the way. And so I think what we put together is um, a document that I do believe addresses a lot of these issues in a very detailed way, probably in a more detailed way than has ever been done before. And what hopefully that will do is show people that this is possible. And if there are disagreements, hopefully they can disagree about certain specifics as opposed to um, you know, disagreeing about high-level concepts. So if you look at a lot of the past negotiations, they're basically trying to wordsmith documents to basically not agree but not admit that they don't agree. And that's not an acceptable way. That's not how you solve problems. That's how you defer problems. And, you know, I, I uh, enjoy working for this president, but one of the things I admire is that he's not going to allow you to pretend like something's solved when it's not solved. His view is we should either solve it or we should admit that it's not solved and try to, you know, really work hard at trying to put a solution for it. Uh, the second thing we started putting together was <clears throat> uh, an economic vision for uh, the region. And what we did is we started looking at um, the divide in, in, in the region. And, you know, when I was on the campaign, all of the experts were saying, well, you have the Sunnis and you have the Shias, and that's the big divide uh, with the Arabs. But what I see in the region is that the big divide now is you have leaders that are trying to empower their people and create more opportunity for them to have a better life. And then you have leaders that are trying to repress their people and often using religion and other excuses as a reason to try and, and hold their people down. And so when we looked at uh, the Palestinians, we said, well, what are the opportunities that they can have? What's been holding them back economically? And obviously, you have the core issues, because you need to resolve the core issues to be able to move forward. But what we started doing is building an economic vision for how do you take that region and push it forward in a more substantial way. And so uh, I think we built a very good business plan. We studied what they did in Poland and how that was successful. We studied South Korea. We studied Japan. We studied Singapore. And then we studied areas like uh, Ukraine, where they had a pretty good plan, but there was not very good execution, and a lot of the governance was off. So uh, what we will be able to put together is um, uh, a solution that we believe is a good starting point for the political issues, and then um, a outline for what economically can be done to uh, to help these people start living a better life. And I, I do believe this, is that there is a greater uh, division between the experts and, and, and the people who, who negotiate this and talk about this and work at the think tanks and work in the negotiations than there is between the people. I think the people fundamentally uh, want to live together. I think the people fundamentally want to have better lives. I think they want their kids to have jobs. They want to be able to pay their mortgage. And I think that that's a very important underline. I think everybody wants to live with dignity. I think the Israelis want to know that they've got uh, security. That's very important for, for this administration, uh, Israel's security. And, uh, and I think if we work it well and we put it out and people uh, look at it with a fresh perspective, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to start a new discussion. And hopefully that leads to a breakthrough. And, and I will just say this. And, and uh, 
is that this is a very hard problem. This is probably one of the hardest problems maybe that exists in the world. And uh, when the president asks us to take this on, you know, Jason, David, myself, he says, no, I want you guys to really try to solve this. I don't want you to make an effort and then try to create a downsize. You could blame somebody else if it fails. He says, I believe that this is an issue that needs to be solved. He says, I don't think if you solve this, the rest of the region turns out well, but I do think you can solve uh, and fix the whole region without this being resolved. And I do think that it is something that's held the region back. And if you think about just the Middle East, you, know, you think about what China has been able to accomplish between 2001 and today. They've built a, a, you know, an, a, a, an amazing uh, economy. They've built a great country. They've taken hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. If you look at the Middle East and what's happened with all the war and all the conflict uh, and all the division, they basically stayed in place, maybe even gone backwards. And if we can figure out how to change the paradigm and get people to focus on betterment of life and how do you create more opportunity and, and, and somehow we have to break this cycle, I do think there's a lot of potential for them to get on a good path. There's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of resources, uh, where it's located strategically, a lot of you know, really great people. And so uh, we're finding reasons to be optimistic and we're giving it the best shot we can. So let me ask you two why questions. The big why and then the tactical why. Uh, I know you started to answer the big why, but I wanna, I wanna go a little bit deeper. Uh, recently at the Time 100 uh, event, you explained that the administration had four big priorities in the Middle East. Uh, the first three, where I sit, certainly make a lot of sense. Confronting Iran, defeating ISIS, combating the ideology of radical Islamic extremism. The question is about what comes up number four. If you had said solving the world's worst humanitarian crisis, Yemen, okay. If you had said, solving the world's worst refugee crisis, Syria, okay. What makes solving the Israeli-Palestinian crisis an important issue, to be sure, what makes that rise to the level of being at that high priority? So I would think that if you would have gone back five, six years, and if you would have asked people what they thought was the biggest issue in the region, they would have said it was this issue. And I think that... Um, what I said at, the, at that last interview was that those were the four uh, issues that we were outlining when we went to Saudi Arabia. And the president chose to take his first trip to Saudi Arabia, and he thought that it was important to, uh, to really uh, get everyone to come together to try to solve these issues and, and say that this is not America's responsibility, uh, this is not Saudi Arabia's responsibility, this is all of our collective responsibility. And I do think that uh, on those first three issues, we've made tremendous progress. If you think about what the president's done to, uh, to get out of the JCPOA, the Iran deal. Uh, I think we've tried to do everything we can to make sure that all of the different areas where they're being aggressive, whether it's Yemen, whether it's, uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's Syria, whether it's uh, with Hamas, whether it's Hezbollah, uh, to make sure that we limit their resources so that, uh, so that they're not able to export terror in the way that they have done. And uh, the administration's been very clear with Iran is that uh, we want to be able to work with Iran, but we want them to uh, to, to not be looking outward. And once they focus on trying to make their country better and, and improving their lives, uh, we're happy to work with them on doing that, but they can't be infringing and trying to destabilize uh, the whole region. And that's been a very, very important issue for the president. Uh, and again, I mean, they chant death to Israel, death to America, the same thing that the Houthis do in Yemen. So the Yemen issue, I think, is more of an offshoot of the Iran issue. So I kind of put that in that, that same box because that's really the root cause of what's happening there with the instability. Um, with regards to ISIS, when we uh, came into uh, this administration, the caliphate was very, very large, and ISIS was, was obviously in a stronger position. And I think the president you know, got together immediately. It was one of the first priorities he set out, and he said, look, we need a global coalition to figure out how to defeat this. And, and I think he worked very well with his generals. He sat down, he studied the, the problem very carefully. And I think the progress we made there is unquestionably um, been uh, beyond people's expectations. I remember seeing the news during the campaign about all the different things we were seeing every day, and it really was brutal, and now that's basically gone, in, in, in a large part, the physical caliphate. Uh, the third thing was something that I personally was much more passionate about, uh, was with regards to uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the ideology, and, and thinking about, you, know, you can, you can uh, kill a terrorist, you can uh, kill a fighter, uh, but how do you make sure that this isn't just spawning more and you're not dealing with this problem for 
a much longer time to come. And I think that the work that we've been able to do uh, with Saudi Arabia and with a lot of the Arab countries and with a lot of uh, the leaders to really figure out how do you get information out, how do you uh, win the war on the internet, how do you uh, make sure that you're uh, monitoring very closely who's preaching what and making sure that people are, are uh, restoring Islam to uh, what it should be as a religion of, of peace and, and, and as a religion of, uh, of, of tolerance. And so I think we've made progress in terms of that, and there's been some good leaders that have worked with the president there. And so I think the, the progress there is also very good in two years. Uh, with regards to this issue, again, we see this as, um, you know, Israel is a very special country. Uh, it's the only democracy in the region. Uh, it's America's strongest ally. They're a great military partner. Uh, we do a lot of business with them in a lot of ways. And so uh, Israel's security is something that's very important to this country. It's something that's very important to the president. And it's something that uh, we want to see, uh, we want to see that resolved. And I do think that uh, a lot of what we'll do here, in order for Israel to be secure long term, uh, they need uh, to resolve this issue. I think it's very important. You have to make compromises in order to do that. Uh, I don't think anyone will question, uh, if we do ask Israel to make compromises in our proposal, that we're going to ask them to do things that uh, would put them at risk security-wise. I don't think uh, the president would take, uh, he would not take decisions himself that he would think would put America and, and the people who he represents at risk, and he wouldn't expect another leader to do that. But he also thinks that if you're able to help the Palestinian people have dignity and have opportunity and create a new paradigm and break this cycle, um, he thinks that that's uh, within uh, the whole region's interest and also in America's interest. We spend a lot of money uh, in that region. Our, our military cost is there. There's a lot of threat uh, that comes from that region. And the more that we can lead towards stabilization, I think that's a very important thing. And Syria is a very important uh, issue as well. And I think that that's something we spend time uh, working on, and I know that uh, Secretary Pompeo has been working hard to try to find uh, what the correct outcome is there, and that's another one of the top priorities. All right, so let, let me ask you the, the tactical why, which is why do you think the circumstances are right for a U.S. peace plan now? Administration officials have said from time to time that the plan wouldn't be presented until the time was right. Assuming that, as has been reported, we're that June 2019 is the time, give or take. What makes that the right time? Sure. So wh when I got in, people told me, you know, you're crazy to work on this. It's not the right time. This is impossible. It will never happen. So I don't think there's ever a perfect time to do this. But uh, I do think what we've been able to do over the last couple of years is, uh, is put ourselves in a position where uh, we do feel like now is a good time to put something out there. I think that uh, when we made the decision uh, to recognize Jerusalem, the president asked, you know, will this make your job easier or harder? And, and the answer I gave him was, I think short term it's probably harder because people will, you know, be more reactive and emotional. And they're not used to, um, you know, a president that a, is keeping his word, taking tough decisions, and, and doing what he thinks is right in that regard. And so I said, you know, this is going to be, uh, a different thing. I said, but long term, I think it helps because what we need to start doing is just recognizing truths. And I think that when we recognize Jerusalem, uh, that is a truth. You know, uh, Jerusalem is the capital of, of Israel, and and um, and that would be part of any final agreement anyway. And I think. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I think that that was a very important component. Uh, the same thing with recognizing the Golan Heights. I mean, the Israel's had gone on for 52 years. It's been relatively peaceful since they've had it. Uh, I mean, Syria is kind of a mess right now. I mean, you've got a leader that's committed you know, mass genocide, and, and the territory is all disputed and broken up. So I don't think there's really any question that the Golan, when things are resolved, uh, that, that it should be part of Israel. And so we recognize that, too. And I think that we're in a position now, uh, uh, obviously, Prime Minister Netanyahu just uh, won, a, uh, I think, a very uh, good election. He'll build, a, hopefully, a strong coalition. And we'll work with him to see what we can do. And, and I do think that in the Arab world, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of impatience, too, with the Palestinian issue. I mean, the, the cause is kind of running dry uh, a little bit with regards to, um, 
you know, people have been funding this thing for a long time. They've gotten more aid than uh, any, uh, any group of people in history. And what we have to show for it is really not much at this point, unfortunately. It's, it's, you know, there are some people who've done very well, and maybe those people like the situation where the aid's coming in and it's enriching you know, a few at the top, but it hasn't trickled down to the people. And, and maybe that's been a disincentive for people to actually want to solve the issues. So you have a lot of people who have been in charge of trying to solve it for a long time, and they have not... Uh, they've been perfect track record at not achieving a solution, and maybe they like it that way. I mean, I see them uh, attacking uh, the deal. They don't even know what's in it yet. And, and I think that that shows that maybe they want the status quo. So what we want to do is put something out that we think is based on logic, where uh, unquestionably we can say that this will lead to the Palestinian people living, living a much better life. And we hope that people will act rationally. And I do think that it'll be a test for the Arab countries, and it'll be a test for the international community. Are they going to be stuck in reflexive positions that don't make sense and that have not uh, created peace? Or are they going to look at this for what it is, study it, and say, this makes sense. Why don't you try to engage with it? If you have you know, problems with these details, you know, why don't you go sit down with them and try to change it? But I do think this is a problem that deserves to be solved, and, and I am hopeful that you know, the leadership from both sides will, will sit together and, and try to you know, figure out, based on the framework we provide, um, how they can move forward. So you, you just made a reference to the leadership from both sides. There's really no ignoring the fact that, that uh, uh, one of the leaderships loves you, and the other leadership publicly vilifies the administration. Um, is that an environment, from your experience, that's conducive to negotiating success? I would say that doing it the old way hasn't really worked. So, you know, our view was, is, you know, we are who we are, and we're going to say what we say, we're going to do what we think is right, and... Um, and people will either react positively to it or they will react negatively to it. And, uh, but at least people know that we're going to be honest with what we do. And again, I think that um, hopefully people will be surprised when they see this that we've tried very hard to take a very, very difficult set of issues. And you know, I said this before, but I had a business mentor who whenever he'd have to take a tough decision would make uh, a T-chart, you know, reasons to do something and reasons not to do something. And I think that when both sides look at this, if they would make the T-chart and say, you know, what am I giving versus what am I gaining? I think they'll see there's a lot more benefits to doing this than in not doing it. And, and that's, I think, the place you have to start. Now, uh, when I speak to people, you know, a lot of the stated position of Arab countries is, well, we're going to do something along the lines of the Arab Peace Initiative. And I said, okay, that was a very noble idea in 2002 when they put it out. But if that would have been a recipe to create peace, it would have made peace 17 years ago. And so, you know, whatever deal is going to make, I mean, you have the Palestinian position and you have the Israeli position, and whatever is going to be resolved has to be somewhat in the middle. And so I think both leaderships are probably a little bit nervous to talk about what their potential compromise uh, solutions could be. So our hope is that maybe we help them get a little bit closer by putting this out. So uh, let me, um, let me uh, just pursue that line of questioning for a moment. So you and uh, uh, Jason Greenblatt have said that the plan will answer all the core questions and it will provide a vision of how life could be better mm -hmm. for Palestinians and how the Israelis can achieve what they want most, security. Um, first, clar let's clarify this. Um, when the president announced the move of the embassy from Jerusalem, uh, a move that I supported, uh, by the way, his, sta his statement included the following, quote, quote, we're not taking a position on any final status issues, including the specific boundaries of Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. Those questions are up to the parties involved. So just to be clear, you're going to propose answers to those final status issues. Is that yes. correct? You will. Yes. All right. Now, Let's look at that equation, better life for Palestinians, securities for Israel. For the Palestinians, it sounds an awful lot like quality of life enhancement. That sounds like money, a lot of money. Whose money are we talking about? Rumor has it that Middle East countries haven't been lining up to pony up to support this. Will there be a substantial American anteing up in order to trigger larger sums from others? How substantial are we talking about? 
Yeah, so since it's not my money to put out, I, it's really, it's other people's money. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that I, and again, you have to be very mindful of rumors. I mean, one thing that I'm very proud of that we've been able to accomplish in two years is we've been able to keep uh, this very close. And we've had a, a leaky uh, environment here in Washington where a lot of things leak, uh, but nothing's leaked from my team and nothing's leaked on this file. And I think that's something that uh, we're very proud of. Uh, I think that that's built a lot of trust uh, for us with a lot of our counterparts, you know, whether it's uh, in Israel, whether it's the Middle Eastern countries, I think they've all seen that after talking with us uh, directly, uh, nothing's ever made it to the press. And I think that uh, over time, built more trust and allowed us to have more productive discussions because they're willing to uh, discuss things more freely, which is uh, very, very important. So I wouldn't go off of what you say. Look, I, I think it goes like this. We have to decide, do we want to keep throwing money into, into a situation that perpetuates a situation and, and even makes it worse. I mean, one of the things that I thought was very funny was they said, oh, we're we were accused of trying to separate the Palestinian people. And then I was reading a book on the hamas Fatah split, and they were basically accusing Hamas of the exact same things that they were accusing us of, you know, about 10 years earlier. And so I think there's a lot of different situations where uh, the situation's just gone back and, and bad in a very, very bad way. Uh, what I do believe is important for the improvement of, of people's lives is you need an environment where uh, people can feel like they're able to invest, right? So the reality is I see so many uh, well-intended programs through the different aid agencies and through different private donors, and they get some entrepreneurs together, or they get an industrial zone or whatever it is. But the reality is, is until you establish borders, establish security, uh, have rule of law, have transparency, eliminate corruption, uh, really enforce property rights and put people in a position where people have an environment where they can make investments and feel comfortable about it, you're never going to really see that economy rise and you're never going to see people's living standards rise and you're never going to see people start to have the, the self-determination and the better lives that they, they, they've been talking about and wanting to get for a long time. So, uh, so I think that we have a real chance to do this, but I think the two have to come together. Uh, I have spoken to a lot of countries about... Uh, supporting this. I've spoken with some members of Congress about supporting this, and, uh, and we'll see. I mean, I think that uh, it's something that hopefully I can get people to sign up for, and uh, so far I would say people are very happy with the work product we've put together. I think they think it's very in-depth. They think it's something that, uh, let me say this, when, when you see it, you'll understand why it took us so long, and I think that that's something that, um, that hopefully people will see as a thoughtful effort, and, and again, I, I, I'll say this too, because I see, you know, a lot of commentary, and, and in Washington, there's a lot of people with opinions, obviously. Um, but what I would say is that people should be, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to want to sound like a wise man in this business and to, and to talk about why this is hard or why this could fail or, or what you know, we're doing wrong. But the reality is, is that, uh, I, I say my favorite quote that I read about the Middle East was somebody said that in the Middle East, the pessimists are usually right, the optimists are usually wrong, but it's the optimists that drive the change. And I think that what hopefully people do is they'll look at all of this stuff and they'll say, um, you know, we want to help you push this forward. We think this is a good idea. We want to push both sides to figure out how to move forward instead of allowing them to find excuses to not move forward. And I think that that's um, where we want to get to. And I think that this framework will hopefully be a framework. Because, look, this has been stuck. This has been stuck for, you know, a long time. Um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of fresh ideas. There hasn't been um, any breakthroughs in a long time. And the reality is, is that the situation is getting more and more uh, untenable. And so uh, we didn't create a lot of the problems. I showed up here two years ago, but I was given the assignment of trying to find a solution uh, between the two sides. And I think what we'll put forward is a framework that I think is realistic, it's based on, it's, it's executionable, um, it's executable, and it's something that, um, that I do think, uh, you know, will lead to both sides being much better off. And that, that was the way I approached it. Fair enough. Um, so you briefly referred uh, a few moments ago to the concept of state, and I want to ask you about this. Um, Ten years ago, in a historic speech, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu outlined his call for a demilitarized Palestinian state. He said, quote, in my vision of peace, two free peoples living side by side in this small land with good neighborly relations, mutual respect, each with a flag, an anthem, and a government. Does that still apply in your view? Like I said, well, we're going to put out a very extensive document. 
and, and I'm going to let you decide, and I'm sure you'll write something very interesting on it when it comes out. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, uh, all right. All right, all right, all right. All right, let me ask you a different question. So during his election campaign, Prime Minister Netanyahu committed himself to begin the process of annexation of Israeli territory at some point, something that he had never publicly said before. What is the administration's view on Israeli annexation of territory in the West Bank? Would you have a problem if this was done before the plan was presented? Have you told this to the Prime Minister? So I have not discussed this with the Prime Minister. And, um, and I do hope that, um, that what will happen is, is as he forms his government, we've been giving him space to do that. I, I do imagine that uh, once there is a government formed, we'll, we'll start engaging on this process and we'll have a discussion. And I do hope that uh, what we're doing, I, I said I hope both sides will take a real look at it, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, before uh, any unilateral steps are made. And, and I hope that they'll look at it and assess it and see if they do believe that this is a pathway uh, for a better future. So is it, is it a fair statement to say that one can either have unilateral annexation or a negotiated solution, but not both? You know, one thing I saw early on in this is that, um, is that there was a lot of, um, our team, we, we'd have a lot of issues that would come up every day. And I, I think a lot of maybe the past people who've worked on this file can relate to this, where every day you're called on a different issue. Well, you know, they're doing this or they're doing that. And I said to my team, I said, guys, you know, our job, we're, we're not in the rabbit chasing business. And they said, well, these aren't rabbits. These are big issues. And I said, well, you know, our, our job is to try to find a solution between the two countries. And that's really the disease. A lot of the, the things that are happening now are symptoms of the disease. And our job is not to deal with the symptoms. Uh, that's for them to deal with between each other. But that's not uh, our job as, as, as in, the, in the role that we're playing. Uh, we believe our job is to try to propose something that could actually uh, cure the disease. And if you cure the disease, a lot of the symptoms go away. And so, uh, again, that's what we've been focused on. Um, you know, there's a lot of distractions. There's, you know, we, we remind ourselves every day, and, and we've done this for the last two years, that there's about a thousand ways to fail on this file. And we've tried our best every day to make the right decisions to try to push forward and give ourselves the highest probability of doing something that can make a difference and achieve a good outcome and try to avoid uh, decisions and uh, situations that will give us a, a pathway to achieving uh, a bad outcome. But, you know, again, if you were just taking the smart money bet, the smart money bet is that um, this is a tough problem and, and it's been around for a long time. Um, but, you know, I do hope we're able to, to change the, the paradigm and put something forward that gets uh, both sides to very seriously look at the facts and, 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 and try to navigate a way where they can allow their people to be better off for the long term. And that's very important to the president. That's very important to me. It's very important to Jason. It's very important to David. So you use the, the metaphor of curing a disease, which is, which is a pretty high bar for success. And I want to ask you about your definition of success. Is success actually solving, resolving this problem, as you suggested? Is success the middle bar of getting the two sides just to engage on what you propose? Is success the lower bar of getting a quorum of Arab states to say this is serious and worthy of discussion? What, in your view, is a legitimate, reasonable bar of success? Yeah, so you're, you're being very Washington with this question because <laughs> uh, 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 it's the Institute, right? Uh, but, you know, again, I, I'm not thinking about it that way. Our, our goal is to go in. We were asked to try and solve a problem. And so, um, you know, one of the things that the president's good at is he's good at coming into a, a situation and being very flexible from the beginning to the end of it. And uh, my view is that uh, what we've done is we've tried to develop a path. We've, we've assessed it. We've tried to uh, tailor make a solution. You know, one thing we've done very differently than what's been done in the past is, you know, I, I remember in my first uh, meeting out, I met with the Israeli negotiator, I met with the Palestinian negotiator, and um, and I asked them. I said, well, let's take these issues, right? Let's on this one issue. What is an outcome that you think you could accept that you think the other side could live with? And he says, well, to do this, you have to go back to 1917, the 1948, the 1967, the 1973. Uh, and I just said, you know, look, we don't want to go through the history on this. I'm just curious here today in 2017, what's an outcome that works? 
I said, okay, well, the way to solve it is you need to get two people together, you need to get four people together, you need to go to Oslo, you need to go to Madrid. And I said, I don't want to talk about process. You know, I said, I just want to come up with what a potential outcome uh, could be here. And what I realized is that it's very um, tempting to kind of get involved in process and get involved in history and fight about things that are not operational to people's lives. And what we've tried to do is focus on a solution that we think is, is viable. And then the last phase is trying to figure out what an appropriate process is to try and achieve that as much as possible. So look, I think at minimum, hopefully people will look at this, think it's serious, it will change the discussion. I think the discussion has gotten stale. I think nothing's worked. Um, and I do think that our, our approach has been is that uh, if we are going to fail, we don't want to fail doing it the same way it's been done in the past. And I, again, the president's... You want to be original in your failure. Well, <laughs> ho 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 hopefully the goal is not to fail, but, 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 but I think that what we want to do is, is figure out how to do this in an intuitive way. Uh, you have three people who are not from politics, not from diplomacy, and, uh, and what we've tried to do is do this in a very rational uh, way and, and hopefully that it's different. And, and, and again, I do think that both sides will look at this. Hopefully both sides think that it's a very serious proposal. Hopefully it, it, it stimulates discussion, stimulates thought, and maybe it leads to some breakthroughs that have been elusive for a very, very long time. I mean, and, and again, you know, our, our number one goal is, is we want uh, the Palestinian people's lives to get better, and we want, uh, we want Israel's security to be stronger, and we want both sides to be able to find a pathway to come together and figure out how to bridge some of these previously unbridgeable uh, divides. Just on the equation you just laid out, Palestinian lives to be better, Israeli security to be secure. Is it, is it not unreasonable for a Palestinian to hear that, that equation and to say, where is my political aspiration in that equation? However I define my political aspiration, is it yeah. at least reasonable for them to say, I just don't hear, if I'm a Palestinian, I just don't hear my political aspiration in the equation of my life being better and, and the Israeli security being secure? I think, look, I'll just say this very straight, which is that I think that uh, the average Palestinian doesn't have a ton of faith in their government. They don't have a ton of faith in their Arab neighbors. They don't have a ton of faith in Israel. They don't have a ton of faith in America, right? They've been lied to for a long time by a lot of people. And I think that they're at a place where I don't think they know what to believe or who to believe. And so um, it's an unfortunate situation, but they've been pawns in a greater, greater game in the Middle East for a long time. I mean, you have a lot of Palestinians that were kicked out of Arab countries for whatever reason and, and put into the situation they're in. Arab countries who claim to fight for them and care about them wouldn't take them into their countries when they were refugees. So you've got a very twisted history there. And I think that um, you've got uh, you know, a current situation where you've got you know, Hamas, obviously, in Gaza, which is um, which has just driven that place into the ground. And it's, it's really, I think the people are hostages to a terror organization. And that's an unfortunate situation. And then in the West Bank, I think you have people who are pretty repressed. And again, I think that they question whether the leadership is actually looking after their interests or not. And so, uh, again, I think that for the Palestinians, the political aspirations are important. I do believe what we'll put out will address a lot of their political aspirations and a lot of their dignity. That is important to us. But I, I just think that they're at a point where they're not able to live the lives that they think they deserve because a lot of this has kind of screwed it up for them. And I do think that. Um, we think about that a lot. And, and again, instead of coming at this from the political uh, lens and say, OK, let's jump into this and do the political negotiation that's been done before in the same way that it's been done before, let's focus on the Palestinian people. And we spoke to a lot of Palestinian people. We spoke to Palestinian business leaders. We spoke to a lot of people. And we said, what is it that you're looking for? And we tried to figure out how to design something that uh, we think can be very acceptable to them. And the question will be whether the leadership um, has the courage to try and jump into it and try to achieve it, and whether they have the intent uh, for preservation or whether they have the intent for actually betterment of the lives of their people. But uh, again, the strategic advantage we have now is we know what's in the plan. Uh, we believe that it's, it's virtuous. We believe that it's something that uh, is beneficial to both sides. And uh, it's been very disheartening for us to see that the Palestinian leadership has basically been attacking a plan that they don't know what it is uh, as opposed to reaching out. If they truly cared about making the lives of the Palestinian people better, 
uh, I think they would have taken different decisions over the last year, uh, and maybe over the last 20 years, but that's um, just my decision. But that kind of doesn't matter, right? You know, the, the, the neat thing about this is we're going to put it out. Everyone has a fresh opportunity to try to engage with it. And when we put it out, we'll be able to uh, see what happens. And people, you know, have speculated in a million ways who will be supportive, who will be not. I was, we don't know. I mean, we're talking to people. We've had a lot of discussions. I think that people will be surprised what's in it. But I hope that people act rationally, which is they, they take what we put out. Um, they read it. They look at it. Um, they look at it for what it is, not for what it's not. And they say, has there been any better ideas put forward? You know, is this real? Could this work? Um, and then based on that, they push forward. And, and so, um, I mean, I, 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 we're doing the best we can. And I, I just think that, again, it's not like... Um, there's a door B that's been presented or, or that we're, we've taken away from them or that's existed that, um, that has led them to achieve you know, things that have been so good for them. So we're, we're just being realistic. And, and I think that that's uh, unfortunately um, the situation as, as, as we found it. But we're doing our best to try to find uh, a solution that I believe will have a lot of opportunity for, for both sides. You referred to the, to the um, a moment ago to laying out the plan. Uh, I just want to ask you briefly about the rollout of the plan, since we're not going to get into the details of what's in the plan. I was going to go through the details then. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the plan going to be a surprise to Prime Minister Netanyahu, to, to the leaders of Jordan and, and Syria and Egypt, not Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt? Um, are they going to be reading about it uh, the same day we all read about it, or are they going to be briefed ahead of time, and will you, will you welcome their input at all before the final, final version is uh, delivered? Yeah, so uh, again, today we've kept uh, the details very close, and, and the way that you know we've kept it very close is that nothing's uh, leaked out, and I think that's been a great asset. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're making the calls now. I mean, we're, we're, we're finally uh, deciphering the process, how we're going to do it, uh, but I do think that all of our, our allies and partners will be very well consulted. Uh, and I do think that hopefully we're putting people in the, oper in the position to make sure that uh, they can be as supportive as possible. But that's not based on relationship. That's based on substance. And, and I do think that uh, we'll figure out what it will be. But again, the, the good thing about what I do is that, um, you know, who I speak with and when we speak to them, um, you know, the people who need to know know about it, but the people who don't need to know usually don't know about it. So that's good. So you said so earlier, the smart money is on not success. After all, you, you're hoping to accomplish what every president since Nixon and every secretary of state since Kissinger has in one way, shape, or form tried to do. But the smart money is not on success, especially given the high bar that you've outlined for success is actual resolution of the conflict. Have you factored into your thinking the implications of failure? Mm -hmm. Failure is its own, has its own set of outcomes and has its own impact on the various parties. What do you think about the potential implications of failure? So one thing that's been different for me about being in Washington is that um, you know, everyone in Washington can complain about the status quo. And then when you, try to, when you try to put something in play to make something better, then all of a sudden everyone goes crazy about all the things that could go wrong, and they talk about you know, how things could also get worse. And look, the, the reality of, of life is that if you want to make something better, you have to take a risk that it can get worse. And you know, our goal is to figure out how do we mitigate the downside and how do we do everything possible to try to achieve the upside. And uh, I, I just think that... What we're doing here is, is, is we've been, and we've been doing this for two years, we've just been telling the truth. And, and again, I think that with our actions, uh, we're telling the truth, we're dealing with reality. And uh, when you do that, I think that it usually leads to, to a better place. And so uh, we're pretty confident that we'll put this out. It'll be a good basis for discussion. Um, again, success can look like a lot of different things. It could look like an agreement. It could look like a better discussion. It could lead to closer cooperation. Maybe we resolve a couple issues. Um, maybe not. but. You know, I just think that the situation is such right now that, um, that I, I just think that 
uh, that, that, that it has to move forward. And I, I do think that not trying uh, is, is, is a big problem, too. And you know, I, I do think, too, and, and I learned this in business, and, and I think people in politics have a harder time with this, but sometimes doing nothing is a decision. Uh, doing nothing is a decision. And, um, and we don't think that that's usually an acceptable decision unless we're doing it intentionally. And I do think here that the status quo and where it's headed to um, is not the ideal situation. And we do hope that what we put out uh, has a lot of different pathways that could potentially make this better. So just, just on this point, because a very wise, some will even say brilliant, observer of the peace process recently wrote, and I paraphrase, <laughs> Issuing the Middle East peace plan in the current environment is a lose-lose proposition. If rightists in Israel build upon a Palestinian rejection to push for annexation, the plan could unleash forces that drive a stake in the heart of U.S.-Israel relations while destroying Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation, perhaps even the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. Is that at least a potential outcome? I just want to say it's so much easier being a writer than it is to be somebody <laughs> trying to actually solve a problem. Um, you know, it, it, it will be what it will be. And, and I think that, again, we, we spend our time just trying to focus on what do we believe is the highest probability path that we can take to create a good outcome, and how do we do everything to mitigate bad outcomes. And, you know, one thing I, I, I've seen in, in, in kind of, you know, in the building I work in is that it's not like you're faced every day with, with the problem and they say, okay, well, this is the good option and this is the bad option. It's usually this is the bad option and this is the really bad option. And you're trying to figure out on a lot of these very tough problems, which, again, you're inheriting, you're coming in trying to assess it. We've inherited a lot of problems on a lot of issues. And, again, I, I've admired the way that the president and his national security team, not just on this issue, but if you look globally, um, we came into what we felt was a strategy-free environment. And uh, I do think that the president, with, uh, with H.R. McMaster and now with John Bolton, have kind of taken the, the world and said, um, these are our different priorities. We put together a national security strategy. We put together integrated uh, strategies on how to get there. The president's taking on a lot of different files at once. Uh, and he can only do that because he's got a very strong vision. He's got a ton of energy. And I think he's got a very good team that's very well coordinated. And now, you know, whether it's Secretary Pompeo, whether it's John Bolton, uh, you know, whether it's myself on a couple of files, whether it's you know, Bob Lighthizer, or Steve Mnuchin, or Wilbur Ross, dealing with all the different trade issues, dealing with all the, um, the different conflict issues, dealing with all of our national security issues, I do think we have um, you know, a very good team uh, working with strategies, working coordinated to try and figure out how do we create the best outcomes possible. And you know, we're always looking. You know, America is, is a great country. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, uh, I've come to, um, to really appreciate uh, what our place is in the world, what our influence can be in the world. I think that, uh, especially on the trading side, I think our presidents brought a fresh approach, which was badly needed. I think that um, a lot of these trade deals that we're doing should have been rebalanced a long time ago, and I think it took somebody disruptive like this president and, and a great uh, trade negotiator like Bob Lighthizer to come in and really shake things up and figure out how do you do it. And in each one of these trade negotiations, too, I mean, people were predicting all the things that could go wrong, and you put tariffs on, and there's retaliation. But the reality is that the president understands how to calibrate risk, and he understands the power of the American market, and he uh, has not gotten us into any wars, and he's been able to uh, he's trying to figure out how to draw us down from wars, but he's been able to figure out how to um, uh, reestablish America's place in the world, but figure out how to balance some of these relationships that are out of whack. And so uh, I guess that's maybe a, a little bit of a rambling answer from, uh, from what you asked, but I think that we view it every day. Like, we come in, we look at all the different challenges, and we're trying to figure out how to achieve an outcome. And again, it's very easy to, to prognosticate and talk about how you know, everything you do has the potential to go wrong, but we've got a lot of really smart people in the government, and everything we do is peer-reviewed, and, and we challenge each other. We do it respectfully now, whereas it used to happen in the press maybe in the beginning with some of the different people, but now it's, it's a very collaborative group. Not everyone agrees with each other, but the president likes it that way, and, and uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, there's one decision-maker, and that's the president. So, and so th This is precisely where I want to end our conversation with um, uh, just a couple of final quick questions. So has the president read the plan? Um, so the president has been involved from the very beginning. And, um, and again, I, th this is one he asked me to work on because it was an issue he wanted to see engaged with. And so 
uh, one thing working for this president. It's, it's, um, it's absolutely amazing because he's got, I think he's definitely increased the metabolism of government uh, in the sense that he's, um, he, he's got so many different uh, cabinet secretaries and, and, and administration officials working on so many different files, and he's on top of all of us. So he's involved with the details. He's been pushing us. We've been reporting back to him uh, with regularity. Um, he's read a lot of the parts of it. Uh, I mean, he hasn't seen the latest draft because we've still been refining. Um, but the president's been very involved in, in creating this and creating the strategy, and um, and he's a, he's a very hands-on leader, and that's uh, that's been a lot of fun to work with him on it because this is one that he does care about. You'd like to see us uh, go forward with in a in a good way. So, lastly, sometime before you go public, I'll, I assume there will be some Oval Office meeting or a Mar-a-Lago family dinner, perhaps. <laughs> Where the president turns to you and asks, okay, Jared, honestly, what's your opinion? This plan is going to have my name on it. Is this going to be a winner? You know I like winners. I really, I really hate losers. Which is this? We don't have to do it. Is it worth it? So when you work for a president, you try hard not to disappoint, but you can disappoint. When you work for your father-in-law, you can't disappoint. So, <laughs> so, so, I, um, so I, 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 I think I've established a good track record now on all the different tasks he's given me. I've come back with results, and I've come back with good advice. And, and I do think that um, this is something that, that I do think he'll be proud of. This is something that I think will be a document that uh, I think we'll be uh, elevating the discussion on an issue that's hard. And, and I think that when you're in the White House, um, I think the biggest mistake is not to try to solve hard problems. And what I learned on criminal justice reform, what I learned doing the, uh, the Mexico-Canada deal, which, again, everyone said we were never going to get a deal with Mexico. And then, you know, last minute we got a deal with Mexico. And then everyone said, well, you didn't get a deal with Canada. You'll never get a deal with Canada. And then we got a deal with Canada. And I did the same on criminal justice. And, and now people say, oh, well, you know, just because you got criminal justice, why do you think you can work on immigration? And I said, well, if you're in the White House where we are, you're supposed to try hard to solve hard problems. And if you're not spending your time trying to solve hard problems, then you're wasting your time. And I think that um, this president is not afraid to fail at things. And he's not somebody who's sitting there saying, well, what's the political calculus on, on this or that? He's saying, this is what I think is right. This is what I think is wrong. I think that's what the American people like about him. And he's willing to let us uh, swing big at hard problems as long as we're doing it in a, in a smart and responsible way. And so uh, I do think this is something that the president will be proud of. I do think this is something that uh, hopefully uh, the community will, will look at. And, and, and look, I, I think that hopefully people, people should root for this to succeed. I mean, people should want this to succeed. I think people should want people to take these issues that maybe have held them apart for a long time and say, OK, you know what? Both parties have to, have to give a little bit, but you'll gain a lot more than you give. And that's how you make deals. And, and compromise is important. And, and that's a noble thing. And so I think that the president will lay out a framework that uh, I think is very uh, defensible, that I think is something that has a lot of new ideas in it and is something that, um, that I think he'll be very proud of. And hopefully it does lead to some breakthroughs. So, um, I personally am, am very uh, honored that he asked me to do this. It's been very interesting working on this file. I'm doing a lot of things these days I never thought I would be doing in my life. This is not kind of the plan I had. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, it's an honor to work on it. And if we can make breakthroughs that can help people live better lives and live safer lives, then I think there's nothing more noble than trying to pursue peace between people, even though it's really hard. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mr. Jared Kushner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you.
We'll have more from the SORF Symposium coming up a little later with more discussion about the Middle East peace process. Live coverage when the event continues here on C-SPAN 2.